Okay, we got Star Wars D infantilized. It works. When the holiday season arrives, I have this tradition that I'm sure many of you also have mm -hmm. of rewatching some of my favorite sagas. Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, Indiana Jones, Spider Man. Yeah. This year. Well, where the Lord of the Rings at, dog? <laughs> well, also, it doesn't take a holiday for me to just go back and rewatch all this shit. I could just be like in the mood. You know what I mean? Here, I watch Star Wars. The original movies and the prequels are a no brainer. They make uh -huh. me feel like a kid again. I experience excitement, anticipation, and glee just at seeing the title scroll. Only this time, I kept watching all the way into the Disney Star Wars content. Uh. And I have to confess, it was rough. Uh. These movies did not make me feel like a kid. They made me feel like a child. Walt yeah. Disney agreed to pay $4 billion for Lucasfilm. Wow, we can make a lot of money. The biggest opening in the history. Yeah, that really sucks for Star Wars because I used to be a Star Wars fan and, and still kind of am, but like not really <laughs> like I like all that old shit, but outside of that, it's like nothing really hits really shows an enormous lack of imagination. Yeah, and that hurts even more coming from George Lucas. Let's be honest. The original Star Wars movies are not without their own faults. Oh, yeah. But this feeling was... Yeah, there's tons of plot holes in all of these movies, for sure. ...new to me. At first I thought, maybe it's just me. Maybe I've outgrown Star Wars over the years. I thought that just as the prequels were silly movies that I enjoy, the sequels were probably the same for a new generation, and I just didn't get it. Yeah. But even as I watched other content such as the acclaimed series the mandalorian i couldn't shake this feeling mandalorian season one not so much two and definitely not three In the back of my mind and as the show advanced it became clearer and clearer to me what that feeling was weirdly enough if i had to describe it I guess it's the same feeling that you get when you're watching Dora the Explorer. Hmm? The show is designed for children, and it is a brilliant show in that it engages the audience by asking them to identify the things on the screen and point them out to Dora. <laughs> oh my god, when you put it like that, dude, it's like... <laughs> yeah, it... yeah. Do you check the map for us and find out how to get to the big hill? In essence, Ugh. this is the type of piece of media that assumes that you need your hand held in order to enjoy it. And that it needs to provide you with constant stimulation and explanation yeah. in order to keep you hooked. Otherwise, you will lose track of things and subsequently lose interest. Yeah, not fun. For every problem... Well then again, I don't know, maybe this is fun for like, kids. And not so much adults. There is a ready-made answer. For every challenge, an almost immediate solution. If the characters need something done, I'm the spy. Then all I need to do is yell at the screen and bam, it happens within moments. This yep. is something that happens again and again in Kenobi and in the new series Ahsoka. And I never thought I would say this, but I. Uh, yeah, I saw Kenobi and decided that that was dog shit. And so I just didn't even bother with Ahsoka, so I have no idea. I could only watch impervious heroes mowed through nondescript goons so many times before I returned to the only spinoff that seemed to be straying away from the usual Star Wars formula. We're going to get there. I'll tell them what happened. Bop. Get bop. I remember how shocked I was back when I first saw it. It felt different. Ruthless espionage with no loose threads, contraband, guerrilla tactics, fallible, morally ambiguous, and emotionally exhausted. Yeah. People. 
Like I saw Andor and it wasn't, it wasn't like spectacular, but I thought it was definitely better than like a lot of other media or, or shows that Star Wars offered, or at least the brand, you know what I mean? It's like, this one was made for you to like, yeah, it, this one definitely seemed like it was made for like adults. All of it has made me firmly believe that Rogue One and Andor do a better job of showing the nature of the Galactic Civil War than any other piece of Star Wars media has to date. It is no secret that one of the quintessential ironies of the original Star Wars is that it is not a war movie. It's a space opera, yeah. inspired by the campy sci-fi magazines, serials, and movies that preceded it. I mean, space I mean, how did George Lucas describe it? Wasn't it like space samurais were the Jedi? Call space opera, but people don't realize it's actually a soap opera. And so, oh shit! And it's all about family problems. And that kind oh yeah, that's a brother and kiss and sister kissing. <laughs> it's not about spaceships. An adventure where a chosen hero rescues a princess and gets a medal at the end. As beloved as the movie is, its narrative reads like a story for children. In the words of director Irvin Kirshner, Star Wars is more akin to a fairy tale than a conventional sci-fi story. And that is fine. To be clear, saying that Star Wars is accessible to children is not a criticism. This oh, yeah. is and has always been by design. Contrary to most sci-fi, which uses distant futures and imagination-defying technology to offer insights on philosophically charged subjects like transhumanism, mm -hmm. the limits of scientific knowledge, and the human condition across... It just seems like, like modern-day Star Wars caters exclusively to kids. And in so doing that, it's like you... I don't know, it's like... Because when you make a movie to like just for kids, it's like there's nothing wrong with it, but like if that's your target market, well then you're trying to like build like an audience. Like the like the generation of kids that are brought up on modern day Star Wars are gonna grow up and unless Star Wars changes, uh they're just gonna come in contact with the same problem that the people that saw the early Star Wars had. It's like, what the fuck? This shit, like, I grew up with this, and I thought it was going to get better, but it's literally the same fucking thing. It's like that whole thing with Ash Ketchum and Pokemon. Like, as soon as I realized that, like, more and more seasons were coming out and Ash wasn't getting, like, older, that was the, the main show that, like, broke it for me. Um, It's like, oh, this is just a business. Ash is forever, like, 12. How old is he supposed to be? Like, 12, 13, or, or some shit? And he is just forever that age. Okay, yeah, that literally just broke it for me. Across time and space, Star Wars has always opted to keep its main narrative beats accessible to people of all ages. For instance, normally in science fiction, the existence of artificial intelligence allows for adult themes to be explored. In movies like Blade Runner or shows like Battlestar Galactica, mm -hmm. intelligent machines serve as mirrors to humanity and make us question the very idea of sentience and free will. Meanwhile, in Star Wars, robots are rarely more than light comedic relief and guilt-free chaff for our heroes to cut through. Yeah. Likewise, the endless narrative possibilities that alien species provide, which are explored in franchises like Star Trek or Warhammer 40,000, ultimately end up sidelined. Bro, I really gotta get on Warhammer 40k. I really do. I, with like Henry Cavill coming out with like being in that one movie or a show or whatever. And it's like, it's like the last bastion of, I don't know, adult, like high fantasy media that isn't going to be bastardized yet. <sighs> and non-humans seem to exist mostly for cosmetic purposes. Or again, for comedic relief. Some may accuse Star Wars of being a superficial piece of science fiction because of the conscious choice not to delve further into these sci-fi staples. But I think that this is an unfair expectation. That is because, to the humans of this distant galaxy, the concerns remain very much the same as those that we presently have. 
it is probably why we can relate to them so much. <laughs> yeah, that scene is always going to get brought up, dude. The, the brother and the sister kissing and you not realizing it until the third or what was it? Until the, s the third movie? Yeah, that's when he's like, my sister has it. <laughs> More than anything else, the story of Star Wars is driven by humans. And at the heart of the story, there are always human themes and ideas. Yeah. The most fundamental of which is the conceptual battle of good against evil. Yeah. The blue and the and the green boys versus the red guys. In other words, there is no room for any other sci-fi themes in Star Wars because the war in question has always been the war between the light and dark sides of the Force. Yeah. Between the Jedi, the Sith, and those who fight alongside both of them. I mean, but then... Okay. These... But then again, if you think about it from the perspective of the Emperor, what was his goal? It's like his only goal ever was galactic peace. That's all he wanted. And he didn't think the Jedi were fit to do it. So he's just like, I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> I mean, you know how he did it, you know, was as another argument, but like the Jedi wanted peace uh, and the Emperor just wanted peace. That's all either side ever wanted. And how they went about it is up for argument, really. These are the themes of an epic fantasy translated into a sci-fi setting. And in a universe torn by perpetual struggle between good and evil, there is little room for other subjects besides those involved in this battle. And this is never clearer than during the Galactic Civil War. But Rogue One and Andor confirm intuitions that we did not know we had. Like that the Rebellion could not afford to sit and wait for some hero of prophecy to bring down the Empire. Yep. Or that opposing the Empire did not necessarily make someone into a hero, or even into a good person. This is what makes Tony Gilroy's Rogue One, and especially Andor, so different from other Star Wars media, and what makes them so refreshing. The themes of casual, indifferent, and cruel oppression, of compromising one's morals for a greater cause, mm -hmm. of forsaking one's future for that of others, fit within the conflict of good and evil while also expanding it. And this is in part what makes a show like Andor more adult. Yeah, the gray in it. One may accuse Tony Gilroy of losing the spirit of Star Wars by alienating the part of its audience that is more enamored with the fantasy aspects, like the lightsabers, the Jedi, and the Force. Which no, fucking, bro. The old Star Wars movies couldn't get, like, Jedi and Sith done correctly uh, because they just picked and chose when and when not to use Force powers Likewise, it's even worse in modern day Star Wars movies in that uh, st uh, force powers are picked and chose chosen when it's convenient for the story, not because the par the character simply has that power at all times. You know, like look at Rey when she just spontaneously got that fucking force heal shit. It's like, oh, surprise. Or if Rey was just, she didn't even need any training and she's just like, Oh, I can remove all the rocks so everybody can like run out of the tunnel. I'm just good at it now. <laughs> yeah, Star Wars has never been able to have like a good, uh, concise, like logical, like linear progression of like force powers or like, ha like, like I said, when trying to like figure out when is a good time to, uh, for a character to get a new power or to like train something and then to use it in the right time. Star Wars has never been able to get that shit done correctly. Which, while more appealing to children than dramatic narratives, are also beloved by adult fans, myself included. For this reason, I want to discuss what I think is what made the original Star Wars so good and so successful. And before we can move on to that, we need to address the elephant in the room, which can only be done by answering a very simple question. Why oh, does not Star this scene. Wars only feel childish now if it was always meant to be accessible to children? Oh, that is a good question. Why does it feel childish now if it was always accessible to kids? I don't know. I'm all the Jedi.
saying that oh yeah this scene i remember this well why does it feel childish now it's because i think for me it's like if i am just watching the old star wars like episode what was it four five six for the first time it's like this is like and you're establishing a universe with uh the original trilogy it's like okay this is what's supposed to happen in all of this stuff and then you know when the prequels come out they go back and fill in the holes of like okay this was the story of one episode one two and three and then this is it one episodes one through six there's like it was understood that with episode four, five, and six, it's like George Lucas knew he didn't have the technology to tell the tell the story that he wanted to. So he's like, okay, I'm just going to wait. And then he made went back and made one, two, and three. So it's like, okay, this was the entirety of the, the George Lucas uh, intended like Star Wars universe, episodes one through six. And there it is. It's on the line. And then, you know, it, he sold it to Disney. And then Disney's going to do their own thing with it. Um... So logically you would think, you know, episode seven, eight, nine would be something like brand new, but it wasn't really. <laughs> that Star Wars is accessible to all audiences does not mean that it is childish, but to pretend like Star Wars was always intended for children is reductive. Even in the original movies, we can already see glimmers of something more. The Empire Strikes Back is a very distinct movie from the original, a sequel that clearly sought to expand the universe while also making the characters more complex. Most importantly, the choices made in this movie yeah. unequivocally de-infantilize the world of Star Wars. There is stuff that is not just a space battle. There's more to it than that. In the opening Battle of Hoth, we finally get to see what a ground war looks like in this universe, and that the rebels are fighting in an unfair struggle where even after destroying the Death Star, they are still at a disadvantage in terms of logistics, budget, and military technology. This theme of unfair, overwhelming odds translates into the narrative beats of the movie, which has no problem taking its time to show us the triumphant heroes of the previous movie at their best, but also at their lowest. Yeah. And that's what makes a, a character good, in my opinion. Like, you don't just see him always winning all the time. You got to see him, like, sucking ass, too. Like, when Luke is doing this little, like, Yoda training montage or whatever. It's like, the modern movies don't really... Like, you don't really see Rey struggling to, like, do anything, really. I'd have to go back and watch him to like figure out if that's like 100% accurate, but like, I, I just don't want to. <laughs> I mean, and I guess struggling is, uh, I would uh, assume like a more adult, like would you consider like struggling and sadness and anger, confusion? All, wouldn't you consider all of those like adult themes? I mean, if you have like an, an infantilized Star Wars, show me where all of that shit is. Um, I mean, a lot of it is probably going to be from a, what's his name, from Kylo, if anything. <laughs> um, but not from like your main characters. This in turn allows us to get a better understanding of the characters. We notice that characters do not act like fairy tale characters, but as human beings. Han Solo does not side with the good guys because he believes in the cause of the Jedi or in the righteousness of the rebellion. Yeah. The reason the smuggler can't bring himself to leave is that his friend Luke needs him and most importantly, he is in love with Leia. His choices are based on fundamentally human emotions. Yeah. He is not and, and just self-gain. If you can think of like a situation to put Han in, he is all about just like self-gain. If this situation can benefit him, he'll he'll stick around. If the situation does not, like he doesn't gain anything from it, he'll he's just like, whatever, I don't give a shit, I'm out. It's not playing a role in the story, but rather acting as a living, breathing part of a world. Likewise, we empathize with characters like Admiral Pitt, 
a man working for the evil empire who is hopelessly subordinated to Darth Vader and forced to play along with his cruel Sith games. The movie takes its time to show us the perspective of the empire in order to highlight that there are people working just as hard as the rebels on the other side. That's actually really good insight. <laughs> like I never thought about that, but yeah, that's freaking cool. And that despite their allegiances, they too are human beings. Another delightfully real thing about this movie is that, for the first time, we get to see the unexpected moments of downtime and preparation of these characters. We see Luke eating his rations, we see Han repairing his ship, mm -hmm. we see Leia briefing the pilots before takeoff, we even see Vader dealing with the banal inconveniences of the chain of command, and taking his helmet off. Oh, shit. Not to mention the plethora of background characters doing, well, background things. Yeah. <laughs> In between the lightsaber battles, space dogfights, and scenic planetscapes, we catch glimpses of moments that make the galaxy feel lived in and make the characters feel real. This, one could argue, is what separates Star Wars from other blockbusters like it. Oh. And what gives it an edge over the competition. Oh, wait, what was this? other blockbusters oh wait total worldwide gross number of films of average of films oh star wars jurassic park transformers avatar hunger games star trek man of the apes terminator men in black alien like it and what gives it an edge over the competition and of course everybody went out and made spaceship movies and they were all horrible you know there's more to it than that you can't oh shit everybody so when star wars came out everyone else tried to make some fucking space movies <laughs> to, to like copycat them just go out and do spaceships even if the narrative is very straightforward to keep it accessible for audiences of all ages there is a depth to the world and its characters that keeps us wanting more and this depth is what kept adults coming back when children were mostly concerned with funny robots cute aliens and mm. cool lightsaber fights yeah However, it, it just wasn't that deep in the later later movies when watching star wars media in the disney era it feels like these elements are what is being prioritized at the expense of a deeper narrative and characterization what we see instead is a constant effort to build the ip by injecting cameos easter eggs and catchphrases, oh, yeah. almost as if to distract us with nostalgia i like this thing member berries the truth is that most hey remember when uh the when luke lifted the x-wing hey remember this hey remember that most of the time the plot is advancing in an artificial pre-planned way and the dialogue is mostly serving the purpose of pushing the plot forward rather than being organic interactions which has the unintended consequence of making characters feel stiff and unnatural <laughs> The location of the Wayfinder has been inscribed upon this dagger. At times... <laughs> yeah. Like, the, like, every character is just one-dimensional. There's no complexity to them. Uh, you can pretty much predict what they're going to say or add to a conversation if you put them in any scene. Uh, yeah. You're never going to get any, like, unique things that any of the characters are going to say. So, yeah, I get it. It feels like there is a planned void space put into these stories for us to laugh, cry, or otherwise interject. This makes the story into a fairy tale. And a fairy tale, while not necessarily being a bad story, is very clearly not real. Yeah. So what makes a story feel real? Oh. For me, there are two essential things that Andor does in order to capture us within its world, to make us feel invested in the story and make the characters' experiences relatable. First is the visual storytelling. The choice to do over-the-shoulder camera angles, almost always at a human height position. The decision to shoot on location and to have oh. the main environments be a limited number of carefully built set pieces. The minute attention to detail and subtle world building of its set design. All of That's actually really good insight. I never would have thought of that. The the over the shoulder like like eye level height. Huh. 
All of these things come together to synergize in such a way that it is not hard to believe that every location we see is as real as the characters within it. It feels like the show took the lessons from Empire Strikes Back and applied them across the board. Andor is not abandoning the spirit of Star Wars, but rather taking iconic elements from the franchise and reframing them in a new way. Let us take a look at some scenes from Andor and compare them to other existing Star Wars media to prove this point. There is right. an immediate difference in the feeling of danger conveyed by these scenes. He said hi. No, no, no. No. No, no, he means what? The simple mindedness of the droid can be used for comedic relief, but yeah. it can also be used to make it into a terrifying machine without empathy or common sense. Bro, when I saw this scene, I was like on the fence of like whether or not this robot was about to like just crush his neck and just kill the main character. Director Benjamin Karen is not only laying the groundwork for K2SO's future appearance here, he wants us to feel powerless before the indifferent violence of the Empire. The same can be said for the TIE Fighters. Yeah, that was a good ass scene. This little like TIE Fighter swoop down. <laughs> when you're lucky enough to be piloting the Millennium Falcon, they die like flies. Yeah. But once you're on the ground with nothing to your name other than a couple of blasters and John Williams' soundtrack is not playing in the background, <laughs> TIE Fighters become far more threatening. Especially when Susanna White directs the shot to be almost like that of a horror movie. These are only two examples, but the same logic applies for the choices in direct- Bro, that's actually really cool. I never would have put that together. Like, direct this scene like a, like a little horror movie. And like, uh, you know how that video- What was that video game? Alien? Like, the, the main bad guy was just the alien walking around and shit. And you see it from like all different types of perspectives. Like if you're under the desk, you only see the alien's feet. If you're in a locker, you'll just see like some slits and you'll see a walk by. It's kind of cool seeing like the TIE fighter from like different perspectives as like it's a predator, like just looking around from like underneath a tree canopy or like it doing that little low, like, I don't know what you call that. Um, like water swipe over the water. Action, editing and cinematography across the entire show. The second key element that makes Andor so special is the dialogue. Andor doesn't just tell us a story. The interactions between characters in Andor don't feel convenient or forced in order to push the plot forward. The conversations feel real and subsequently they make the characters feel real and make us connect with them. Make us understand them, their motives, their emotions, their place in this universe. The guiding principle in Andor is always this. Show, don't tell. Yep. Show us characters in their day-to-day -day life. Down to the logistic conversations they have and the unexciting personal choices they make. Seeing Dedra taking pills and doing overtime tells us more about her than any amount of exposition could ever do. Oh shit. Seeing Cassian's reaction to Val and Terramin's ignorance regarding the load clutch and the box freighter makes it obvious that there is a difference in practical experience between him and them. Yeah, the, the whole show don't tell thing. If I ever watch like another Star Wars movie again, that's like a named or like a new has like a number in it. I don't even know, dude, if they can ever be good again, as long as it's in the hands of Disney. Um, because they just have these like weird lines in the movies, like I'm the spy or there's the map or what does C-3PO say? It's like, there's a, a map inscribed on this knife. Uh -huh. I found it and a whole bunch of other, like just weird things that are only said because the movie needs to audience to, you know, be handheld through the entire thing. And it's like, it, it's kind of jarring. And it's like, why did he say that? Oh, because the movie thinks I'm stupid. Oh, okay. In seeing Cyril's conversations with his mother, 
we understand everything there is to understand about his insecurities and where they originated. Show us, but don't tell us. Exposition may clarify things, but it could never give us as real and intuitive an understanding about these characters as we can get from seeing them eating, walking, talking, living. As we watch Andor, the showrunners make us look for the story threads that are weaved by these characters instead of offering them to us on a platter. Mm -hmm. This is a much more efficient trick to keep adults engaged in a TV show. If we look at some of the most acclaimed and influential TV shows of the last two decades that were made for mature audiences, we will find that they all have one thing in common. They are all shows where, regardless of the quality of the main narrative, what kept audiences coming back for more were the characters and the world they lived in. More specifically, the way in which the world they live in and the experiences they go through affects them and changes them in a way that feels real. As opposed to a character going through something and they are either unfazed by it or so they undergo like no change or they undergo a change that doesn't really make sense and doesn't feel real. Through these characters, we can understand why the story is being told to us and why it is being told through them. Andor's cast of characters is one of its greatest strengths as a piece of media. Not because they are iconic or memorable, but because they are fundamentally tied to the key ideas explored by the series. They are multi-dimensional characters and this doesn't just make them more interesting, but also allows for the show to tell us its messages without needing to rely on exposition. This is because these characters are not just telling us a story as if we were children who did not know any better. Their words carry weight because they remind us of the harder truths with which we have become acquainted over the course of our lives. Mm. We resonate with their words because, like us, these characters are just people at the end of the day and only people can live through something real. True. There is a wound that won't heal at the center of the galaxy. We are health care providers. We treat sickness. The Empire is a disease that thrives in darkness. There's a growing list of things we've known and forgotten, things they pushed us to forget. Things like freedom. The Empire has been choking us so slowly we're starting not to notice. So much going wrong, so much to say, and all of it happening so quickly. The pace of oppression outstrips our ability to understand it. You put a number of options on the table, and they're so wrapped up in choosing they fail to notice. You've given them nothing they thought they wanted at the start. The arrogance is remarkable, isn't it? They don't even think about us. <laughs> they're so proud of themselves. They don't even care. These are a lot of great lines. <laughs> they're so fat and satisfied. The way they laugh, the way they push through a crowd. The sound of that voice telling you to stop, to go, to move. The way you die. It's in the air, doesn't it? I've been turning away from the truth I wanted not to face. We were sleeping. I just need you to wake up. You can stand to see the Imperial flag rain across the galaxy. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem if you don't look up. It's better to leave, better to eat, sleep, do what you want. You know what a lot of these lines remind me of? This kind of reminds me of like being in the Matrix. Like, uh, it's like, oh, the, the empire is all around you. And all you're doing is living this little life in your little town. And you're just like, you're just going through your day to day. And when you look up, you can notice, uh, Hey, you got no freedom, you know, much the same way that, like that the matrix was like, you know, with like the whole, uh, red and blue pill thing. You die being careful. If there are heroes brave enough to take on a whole imperial garrison, I'm brave enough to stick it out of here. People are standing up. Random acts of 
insurrection are occurring constantly throughout the galaxy. And even the smallest act of insurrection pushes our lives forward. Remember that the frontier for rebellion is everywhere. Do you really think the rebels care about the lines we draw on maps? Security is an illusion. The public order resentencing directive is the next step on an all too predictable march toward complete unchallenged authority. Authority is brittle. Oppression is the mask of fear. Need the fear. Need them coming down hard. I want everything out here. Show of force immediately. Yeah, and a lot of these themes with the the shit that's going on in the background, it's like these are all like adult themes. People will suffer. That's the plan. Oppression breeds rebellion. Don't you want to fight these bastards for real? And what do you sacrifice? I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago for which there's only one conclusion. Right. I'm damned for what I did. Oh, shit. To burn him. I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy. Oh, okay. So he's just showing like all of like the good ass like adult scenes that they're not. Um, they're just scenes that you would probably not more likely see in like modern Star Wars. These are like more morally gray scenes. It's like I'm doing this for the greater good meanwhile if you like zoom into this like one thing it could easily be considered as like uh, objectively bad thing but if you zoom out it's like oh i gotta do this little bad thing for like the greater good i burn my decency for someone else's future i burn my life to make a sunrise that i know i'll never see there's no way out alive of that you must be sure so what do i sacrifice Everything! Tell him he knows everything he needs to know and feels everything he needs to feel. And when the day comes and you two pull together, he will be an unstoppable force for good. I mean, all the heroes I can get. What have we done, pal? We've chosen a side. We're fighting against the dark. Making something of our lives. This is what revolution looks like. We're playing straight into their hands. Whose hands? The rebels. We're treating what happened like a rebel. What would you call it? An announcement. It's calling war. The real shock will be when they discover how ready and eager we are to respond how tight we close our fist they just killed the hundred men to keep them quiet i call that power 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 doesn't panic if the empire Dang. has this kind of power what chance do we have what chance do we have oh so okay so he's using rogue one and andor the question is what choice is there there will be times when the struggle seems impossible Alone, unsure, dwarfed by the scale of the enemy. Freedom is a pure idea. It occurs spontaneously, without instruction. You think anybody's listening? I do. Someone's out there. And I think a lot of these scenes are good examples of the whole uh, show don't tell thing. Or, or, did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I did. The day will come when all these skirmishes and battles. These moments of defiance will have flooded the banks of the Empire's authority, and then there will be one too many. One single thing will break the siege. Remember this. Try. There comes a time when the, the risk of doing nothing becomes the greatest risk of all. Maybe fighting is useless. Perhaps it's too late. 
and honestly, I'm just noticing this now, but like a lot of different characters are just literally delivering, delivering like great lines, just period. They all don't come from like the main character. It's like every character is in a unique position to, you know, figure out what they're going to do. And it's usually like something gray. Yeah, man. Wait, is this? Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, man. This is a great ass video, dude. I mean, I don't know if we're ever gonna get anything good from from Star Wars again. That's a big question mark. I mean, I hope. I'd hope so. But honestly, I don't think as long as Star Wars is under Disney, I don't think it'll ever happen, really. Um. But I mean, who knows? We'll see, but overall, like, yeah, I mean, maybe they'll come out with like, I mean, at best, what, what would happen? Like they come out with like an Andor season two and maybe it's directed by the same dude. Um, maybe it'll be as good or maybe better. Uh, like, who knows? That's, <laughs> I know that's like kind of doomer to like kind of say, but like, honestly, I don't really see Star Wars getting better. If, as long as it's in Disney's hands, it's just not happening. Um, but yeah, this is a great ass video and yeah, I want to see more and I'm a fan. So, uh, yeah, I mean, until the next one, I'll, uh, catch you guys later. All right. Peace.